All right, so what are our learning objectives for today? We want to articulate compliance requirements of post-secondary transition planning. We will understand section five of Ohio's IEP document. We will distinguish between IEP compliance and delivery of service compliance. And we will familiarize ourselves with the tools and resources used in transition planning. This first, first video that we're gonna share is from Ocali. It's just five things about secondary transition planning. Um, I think they do a really nice job of kind of laying it out for you. So we're gonna go ahead and show that. Can you hear it? Center at Ocali. And I'm Alex Corwin from the Department of Education. I'm the OTSP project for you, and we're here to tell you five things about secondary transition. It's never too early or too late to start transition planning. You'll talk to a lot of people and they'll tell you, start early. But you know what that means? That means as a child is, is very young in elementary school, you just start talking about what do you want to do when you grow up? You start talking about being a member of the community. You start looking around at what people do. That's starting early. When you get close to age 14, it starts to be more formal transition planning. But you know what? It's never too late either. So you haven't started. It's okay. Get that team together, whatever age you're looking at, and get started talking about who do you want to be when you grow up, what am I good at, and where do I want to go? Collaboration. It's important to identify the different local agencies that can help a student and IEP team support that student with their post-school goals and make sure that they are included in the IEP planning process. Those local providers can range from different areas around the state, but traditionally they include local DD boards, OOD offices, CCMEP providers, mental health organizations and counselors, and other local organizations that can provide services and supports to a student after school. It's complex. Sometimes students and families can get overwhelmed preparing for adult world. When the student is in the school system, they generally have one plan, one set of rules, and one roof under which they receive all of their services. Once they transition to adult world, they have multiple agencies that are involved that have different services, different sets of rules, and different plans like the ISP and the IP. Just know that all transition planning teams are experiencing the same flashes of panic. If you collaborate early, have a dynamic and comprehensive team, and ask a lot of questions, generally those teams feel less anxiety around the transition planning process and have better post-school outcome. Students' needs, interests, and preferences are different, and they may evolve over the course of the student's life. This is not atypical of other students as well. Just know that every student's journey will be different, which means every outcome may be a little different. Use backwards planning. Backwards planning means starting with knowing where you're going. Once you know where you're going, then you can identify those experiences, those people that you need to talk to, those classes that you need to take in order to be able to walk the path that you need to get to where you want to be as an adult. For more information, please go to education.ohio.gov slash parents. Under the High School Resources page is Secondary Transition and Workforce Development. Also, for more information, go to ocali.org and click on Lifespan Transition Center or the Family Center. If you haven't checked out Ocali, be sure to do so as soon as you can. There is so much information that they share, not just in... Um, transition, but they have every aspect of education. And it's not just for students with autism, it's for all areas and all disabilities. So make sure that you do check out Ocali. On this next screen, I have a few QR codes and hyperlinks um, that are from the Ohio Department of Education and also Ocali. The Ohio Operating Standards, for those of you that don't know, hopefully you all know, but for those of you that don't know, the operating standards um, were updated. The new standards went into effect on July 1. They have not released the official uh, standards book that we're all used to. Hopefully that'll be coming soon. But for right now, when you go to the website, there are individual hyperlinks 
um, that you can cl click on each section of the operating standards. The universal support materials are off of ODE's website as well. They have everything from IEP writing, ETR writing, transition plan writing. Um, there's blank forms on there. Um, it kind of has an outline of what to expect, what you should do. That would be like your tier one support um, for writing IEPs and ETRs. And then I did put that hyperlink for the Ocali transition planning and the IEP process. Again, that's just one small aspect of Ocali. There is so much to them. Um, you could spend days and days and days going through their site, but I do highly encourage you to do that if you have a chance. These are a few links with regards to transition. Um, the first one is called the Continuous Improvement Toolkit. Um, as an educator prior to coming to State Support Team, I will be honest, I did not know about this resource. Um, and several of my colleagues right now are shaking their head that they didn't know about the resource either. So let me share, share it with you. The Continuous Improvement Toolkit, the link that I have on here, takes you directly to the special education links or resources. And then you can choose secondary transition resources where there's so many different links available. Um, there are There's a team of us that get together monthly that vet out and trial the different things that come to us. And if we see that it's worthwhile and we want to make sure that we share it with all of you, it will be added to that continuous improvement toolkit. You do not need a login in order to access that. It's for everyone. Um, and like I said, it's not just for special education. So there's all kinds of information on that site. Um, but the key piece that I'm interested in today is the secondary transition resources. The National Technical Assistance Center on Transition, I kind of see them as like the guru of transition. So if you haven't had a chance to check them out as well, please do so. You do need a login for their site, but there is no cost or fee. It's just their way to figure out who's accessing the site. But once you create a login, there are so many resources available to you. Um, and I will use some of them today during the presentation. So definitely check that out. And then the Ohio Age Appropriate Transition Assessment Library. This is something that the 16 state support teams across the state um, got together and they've been they've added some AATAs to this library. Um, and it's not just AATAs, um, it's also there's mental health resources on there as well. Um, so definitely check that out. It's also broken down into the three areas of transition. So you can look for employment resources, um, education resources, independent living resources. So what is the purpose of transition in IDEA? The purpose of IDEA is to ensure that all children with disabilities have available to them a free appropriate public education. People refer to that as FAPE that emphasizes special education and related services designed to meet their unique needs and prepare them for further education, employment, and independent living. You'll notice that we highlighted, underlined, made bold, put it in red, that very last sentence of preparing them for further education, employment, and independent living. And the reason why we highlighted that and made it bold and underlined and in red is because that is transition. You know, people ask, why do we have to do this? Well, it's written right into the IDEA. So we are helping to prepare these students for life after high school to make them as independent as possible. The um, next few slides that we'll be sharing the new Ohio operating standards and the sections that focus on transition. We have copied the exact verbiage from the operating standards and we underlined key pieces of information. We'll go through these slides kind of quickly as it, it's a lot to read. Um, however, we've provided you a link to those operating standards in those previous slides. And I know Talia has also added it into the chat bar as well. Like I said, these next few slides have a lot of words. Do not feel like you have to take notes. I just wanted to make sure that you saw this direct information because there is some updates, um, not a lot of changes, but they did add some updates to the forms that I wanted to share with you. So we're gonna go over the definition of transition services, IEP transition services and participants in the process and delivery of transition services and coordination. 
Rule 3301-5101, the applicability of requirements and definitions. On this is all the definitions throughout the Ohio operating standards. And the 69th definition is titled transition services. It is a coordinated set of activities for a child with a disability. It is a results oriented process to improve the academic and functional achievement of the child as they transition from school to post-school activities. Transition services are based on the child's needs and take into account their strengths, preferences, and interests. I'm sure some of you have heard the term knowing the student's pens, their preferences, interests, needs, and strengths. This is exactly where that comes from. Notice that I um, that it says that it needs to focus on the child's needs, and then you take into account the strengths, preferences, and interests. That's very important. The needs are what needs to come first and what you need to be looking at initially. Transition services need to be provided by someone who has the competencies, experience, and training to meet the student's transition needs. Individuals coordinating transition services must either obtain the transition to work endorsement to their current teaching license, or they must possess the eight skills that are listed on this slide A through H. I'm not gonna read through all of those. You will get the PowerPoint at the end. Um, but just know that as a coordinator of transition services, you either need to have that transition to work endorsement, or you at least need to be able to say that you can carry out those eight functions um, or possess those eight skills. Transition services may be special education, or it may be a related service. When referring to competitive environments, that means competitive employment, in an integrated setting. So working with others without disabilities, making the same or comparable wages and benefits. Rule 33015107 are the operating standards on the individualized education program. Section E, subsection two, focuses on transition services and outlines the rules within. So transition services in Ohio must start the year the child will be turning 14, but it can start earlier and they must be updated annually. Post-secondary goals and age-appropriate transition assessments related to education, competitive integrated employment, and if applicable, independent living must be completed. Transition services, including course of study, must be identified and a transition progress report is required to be provided to the parent at least as often as report cards and if applicable during interims. So again, we've always known we needed to do progress reports, but now it's clearly stated in those operating standards that it is required. Within that same rule under section F subsection two is transition service participants. It clearly states the educational agency, most of us refer to that as the school district, but the educational agency must invite the child to attend the meeting. If the child doesn't attend, you must ensure that the child's preferences and interests are considered. When appropriate and with consent of the parent or child, if the child's of age of majority, the school district must invite participating agencies that are likely responsible for providing or paying for transition services. An example of this would be opportunities for Ohioans with disabilities. So as long as you get that consent or informed consent from the parent or from the child, if they're 18 or older, to invite outside agencies, you are required to do that. Um, so just make sure that's noted. And I think the next slide, Within the same rule under section I, subsection three, it outlines what happens if there's failure to meet that transition objective. So if the participating agency fails to provide transition services as written in the IEP, the school district must reconvene the IEP team to identify alternative strategies to meet the transition objectives for the child set out in the IEP. 
An example for this is I've heard districts say only our school staff can be listed as the IEP on the IEP as a provider for transition services. This is not the case. If an activity is discussed and added to the IEP, and let's say it states that the OOD coordinator is the one providing the service, maybe it's like setting up pre-eds or summer work internships, something along those lines, the OOD coordinator can be listed as a provider. In this particular rule, it's stating that the school district will monitor the activity to ensure it is actually taking place and that the district finds, and if the district finds that it's not occurring as written in the IEP, then the district must reconvene the IEP team meeting to amend the IEP and change, tweak, rewrite, or whatever you need to do the activity. And of course, document that within the PRO one if the activity didn't occur. Rule 3301-5109, Delivery of Services. Section H, Personnel Qualifications in Personnel Development, subsection seven, Transition Services outlines the differences between a coordinator of transition services and a provider of transition services. So as mentioned previously, those coordinating transition services either need that transition to work endorsement or they need to possess those eight skills outlined in the previous definition. And individuals providing transition services need to possess the appropriate credential, skills, or knowledge to carry out that transition service as written in the IEP. So there is a, a separation as far as who's doing what. So you have the coordinator, and then you have the individual that's providing the service. Generally, that would be your intervention specialist or related service personnel. And lastly, Rule 33015109, Delivery of Services, Section I, Service Provider Workload Determination of Delivery of Services. Subsection 4, Transition Services, Talks, Workload, Caseload Numbers. So someone coordinating transition services can have no more than 75 children between the ages of 14 through 21 or younger, if appropriate. And this person can also work with no more than 20 intervention specialists that are the ones providing the service to the student. So a coordinator oversees everything. They get the plan together. They support this, um, the caseload in that way, you know, making sure that different agencies are invited, ensuring that different parts and pieces are put together. So a coordinator can have 75 students on their workload and 20 intervention specialists who are the ones providing the service to the student. If a person is the one coordinating the service and providing the transition service to the student, they must operate in accordance with the workload determination for delivery of service as defined in this rule and requirements limiting the number of students per licensed professional as described in the rule. So we're not gonna go through each of those workload requirements for each disability category, but you can find those in that rule 3301-5109 delivery of service. And that's in um, section I, subsection 2A through 2H. And it outlines based on the age of the students, it outlines based on the disability category, um, and then if it's a cross-categorical um, provider as well, there's a different workload calculator for that. The operating standards that we talked about state that at minimum, transition planning must take place the year a student turns 14. However, best practice indicates that this needs to start earlier. So I wanna hear from you guys, what are some ways your school or district has begun transition planning before the age of 14? And you can go ahead and then if you want to um, raise your hand, unmute yourself, put it in the chat. We're just gonna take a few minutes. I just want your ideas and to share with each other. What are you doing in your district or within your program if you have started transition planning prior to 14? In my previous role as coordinator, um, we just had the steadfast rule. Our school district had an intermediate building that was grades five and six and the middle school building that was grades seven and eight. 
So most 14 year olds turning 14 is usually about eighth grade. A couple are seventh grade. We just made the steadfast rule that we were going to start transition planning in seventh grade for all students. So that was one way that we started it prior to the age of 14. So even our young seventh graders who are 12 turning 13, we went ahead and we started that process with them. So that was an example of what I did to start the process earlier. Okay. So I also have an example, sorry. <laughs> Um, I was an assistant director of special education in a very large county in Florida for two years. And in Florida, it is a rule there per the state of Florida, because we're, we're always governed by federal rules, but then states also have local control. Um, but in Florida, they had to start transition planning at the age of 12. So when that kiddo turned 12 during that IEP year, they would start doing the transition planning. And I've always said kind of my whole career, it's going to keep backing up and backing up until we're transition planning way down in preschool. Because if you think about it, every stage that a child goes through in school is a transition. When you tra transition from preschool to kindergarten, when you transfer uh, transition from elementary school to middle school and so forth. And our goal is always to... Um, help that student decide what they're going to do when they leave us. Um, we did get a couple comments in the chat with some responses. Um, looks like Columbus City Schools, middle schools take visits to their district career centers. Um, someone else is offering career ed seminars to their middle school students at OSD. Um, it looks like the another school is working with middle school intervention specialists to address transitions. Um, elementary and middle school students also have SEL, which discusses community involvement roles, um, also at OSD. And then another one is in the um, one of our SST 11 consultants old district. Um, they be began touring the magnet tech and vocational schools in the fifth grade. So prior to entering middle school. So thank you guys for your feedback. And if you really think about it, I mean, most of you are probably um, more secondary intervention specialists or coordinators, but if you look at your districts as a whole, you know, as early as preschool, they start talking about career options and they have different personnel come in. I know at the, my previous district in the preschool, we had firefighters come in, police officers, doctors, um, a nail technician came in and just spoke to the kids to talk about their job. And oftentimes they were actually the student's parents that came in and shared about their job. But that's a form of transition planning and starting the process early. The earlier you could start, the better it's going to be, not just for you, but for everyone. And it looks like one more, our 21st century after school program provides opportunities for residential students, um, first through eighth, to engage in extracurricular activities such as cooking, gardening, study skills, and more. That is great. And that's at OSD as well. At OSD, you guys are rocking it. Nice job. So transition-focused education. Research has found that post-school outcomes of students with disabilities improves when multiple stakeholders and organizations work together to implement a broad perspective of transition planning or a transition-focused education. In other words, you shouldn't be doing this alone. A strong transition plan involves multiple participants, multiple agencies, and it's a process that takes time. It's not going to be something that you do the day before an IEP meeting. It's not something that you do during the IEP meeting by any means. It's a process. It takes time. You need to be planning, um, you know, really looking towards that future of what that student wants to do. And so a lot of you, I'm sure, are asking that question, you know, where do I begin? How do I even know where to start? So the first thing I want to go over with you is the taxonomy for transition programming 2.0. You need to begin with a strong transition program. So even if it's just you doing this on your own as an intervention specialist or a coordinator, 
and you're kind of running things your way because it may just be you, I really want you to think about not in isolation, but how can you as a district or as a program work to improve the program as a whole and what areas you're going to be looking at to do that. So in 2016, the Taxonomy for Transition Programming 2.0 was created. It's an updated version from the original model. Uh, previously, it was referred to as Kohler's Taxonomy for Transition Programming, so you may be familiar with that. This newer model continues with those five primary practice categories, so you'll see them there in the squares. Student-focused planning, student development, interagency collaboration, family engagement, and program structures. The 2.0 version includes additional practices in the areas of student supports and instructional context within that student development, as well as school climate in the program structure. Within family engagement, a focus on cultural relevancy, empowerment, and family preparation are emphasized. Across categories, you'll see collaboration with service agencies, especially vocational rehabilitation. Emphasize the importance of such connections prior to and during school and post-school transition. This is essentially a model for planning, organizing, and evaluating transition education services and programs. At the bottom of this slide is a link to the OEC Live Finder titled Innovative Strategies for Secondary Transition. And I see that Talia also added the link into the chat for you. Um, the OEC gathered information from around our state. So there's information from all different school districts, all there's career centers, there's urban, um, there's you know, rural community schools, all of that. So they all share different ways in which these five dom domains are being addressed within their various district. So these are just highlighted ways that different districts have um, focused within these different five areas of transition programming. So where do you begin? How do you know the order in which things need to be completed? And how do different parts of transition planning feed into one another? Well, I came across um, a website, which is through Seattle University, and they have a document titled The Quist. The Quist, or the Quality Indicators for Secondary Transition, is a free program improvement tool developed by the Center for Change and Transition Services, which is part of that Seattle University. It enables school districts to self-evaluate their transition services for students with disabilities. It is not used for compliance monitoring. So again, I'm gonna state that, that don't use this as compliance because it's not compliance monitoring. It's just to help you kind of identify you know, where your areas of strength are in transition programming and where maybe your areas of need or where you may be lacking that you need to beef up that area. When you go to the website, you'll be asked to download an Excel spreadsheet. It utilizes a Likert scale of zero to three, and then it calculates and identifies the program's relative strengths, areas of caution, and then areas of needing improvement. How do you know the order in which things need to be completed and how do different parts of transition planning feed into one another? So we have two flow charts here. Now keep in mind with these flow charts, I personally want to merge these two charts together. The one on the left, when you look at it, it starts with the AATA and then you write your post-secondary goals and then you identify your services, then the course of study, the annual goal coordinating adult agency. It's missing that future planning piece. And then the second one, when you look at the circles going across the, or down through the screen, it starts with future planning, which is great, but they're really missing that coordinating services with adult agencies. They don't even have that piece to it. Um, and they also swap their course of study and their transition services, which doesn't really affect much, but you know that's just something to note that with the two different flowcharts. The transition planning flowcharts show how each level flows from the previous level. So in the same instance or on the same um, documents, you'll see that there's little lines that kind of show the flow between one level to the next. It needs to be continu continuously assessed and updated. So this isn't a, you create it and then you're done. 
this is you need to continuously assess it, look at it, tweak it, change it, whatever needs to be done um, throughout that student's career in school. And then any changes in one level are most likely going to result in changes in other levels. So if you see a change occur, you need to also look at, oh, if it, if it changed here, how did it affect this other area for the student? All right. Can you please elaborate on the course of study you are referring to in an IEP? Do you mean that small box in section five? If so, what should be there other than OLS or EOLS? Yes, that is exactly what I'm referring to. And we will get to that during this presentation, I promise. Um, the first thing we're gonna do, and the reason why is that we do it first is our future planning. So section one of the IEP is that future planning section. This is where you need to start. Every student identified with a disability and found eligible for special specially designed instruction address the child's future plans in section one. It doesn't matter if the child is three or if they're 21. Every IEP starts with a child's future plans. What is their vision of their future? Future planning is what drives transition planning, begins the conversation for those students turning 14 during the life of the IEP and beyond. It is required to have a parent and guardian and student input to meet compliance requirements. It summarizes the student's skills and interests. It assists teams in planning for that student's future. One thing I will note is that some districts make the mistake of in the future planning box of the IEP, they put a statement that says the IEP team wants for the child's future or what the school staff wants to see for the child. I hate to tell you, but it's not about you. It is about them and it's about their plans. It's about their future. It's about their needs. In a perfect world, they're going to have so much passion and drive and excitement that it's easy to help them plan for their future if they have an idea of what it is that they want to do. We want to see that in excitement out of them. Can parents articulate this statement? Yes, parents can articulate this statement. Again, you want it to be the vision of the child though. So if you're talking about younger kids, if um, for you know, age three on up to age 12 or 13. Yes, the parent can be the one to articulate the statement, um, but we also wanna make sure that it's, it's surrounded by what it is that the, the student actually wants. All right, are there any other, do we need to include or address all four, academics, employment, education, training, independent living, and future planning? Best practice would be yes, that you do include all of that. Um, but for sure, the employment, the education training, and the independent living. Um, you know, I had it in my previous um, district. I had it automatically populate um, like headings, two sentences. So it was, you know, Aaron wants, and then the teacher would fill in what the student says that they want. So Aaron wants to attend a four year college to major in education. Um, Aaron wants to work full time as a teacher. Aaron wants to live independently and own a house, you know, whatever it might be. Um, but it was always the student, what the student wants. And then we highlighted those three areas. So after you do section one of the document is when you start the section five. So the next steps in that transition programming um, are in that section five. And I have them listed out there and we are going to go through each of these. Students turning 14 or older must be invited to the meeting to discuss this section of the IEP. Just checking the box to say that the student was invited isn't enough. So if we're talking about compliance, we need to show that you truly invited them. So one way to do that is you could put the student's name next to the parent's name on the invitation um, to show, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Smith and Jacob Smith as invited to the meeting. Another way to do that is to give the student a completely separate invitation. You can have more than one invitation to the meeting. So you could have a parent invitation and then you could also have a student invitation. But just marking down on the bottom of the form that where it has the participants and it has the check boxes to fill out, just checking that the student was invited isn't enough to show that they were invited. 
parents can also choose to not have their child in attendance. Um, if the child is not 18, the parent can say they don't want the child there. I strongly encourage you to talk with the parents about this. Explain to them the importance of having the student attend the meeting, even if it's just for this portion of the meeting, um, to really show that connect of this is about the student. It's not about what we want for the student. This is about what the student wants. Um, and the whole transition planning and processing, it, like I said, it takes time. So you should have been collecting quite a bit of information up to this point of you writing the document, um, that this is the time for that student to shine and show all the hard work that they did with the age appropriate transition assessments and the interviews and you know the research and whatever else they may have done for you for this part of the IEP. It's their time to kind of highlight that and to be proud of who they are and what it is that they want to do. So like I said, we're going to talk through each of these. We will take a break in between them, so I don't want you to feel like you're going to be sitting here forever. This first part is about the age-appropriate transition assessments. You'll notice on the screen I have up across the top the three areas outlined of post-secondary training and education, competitive integrated employment, and independent living as appropriate. The little picture at the bottom of the screen is just a snapshot of what it looks like within the IEP. So for those of you, I'm sure that you realize that on the traditional page of the IEP document, you have three boxes that look just like this. The first one is that employment or education and training. The second box is for the integrated employment and that bottom box is for the independent living. You should have at minimum two age-appropriate transition assessments for each goal area. Again, that is best practice to have at least two AATAs for each of those three goal areas. Your AATA section is a summary of the results of the assessments. So you're not cutting and pasting the entire um, employability life skill assessment if you use the ELSA. You're not copying that entire document. You're not attaching it to the IEP. You're just giving a, a summary or a synopsis of what the results were of that assessment. In the AATA section, you also must state the name of the assessment that was given, the date that the assessment was given, or if it was given over a couple dates, you could put like October 1st through 3rd of 2023. Um, and then you also need to state who gave the assessment. Um, so if I were writing out a plan, let's say, and I did an assessment with a student, I would say the employability life skills assessment was given to Peter on October 3rd, 2023, and Aaron Curtis intervention specialist gave the assessment. So I would have that documented. Usually I would put that in bold. You're not required to. It's just nice to kind of separate out which AATAs you gave. You can also use the same assessment to gather information for each of those three required areas. So the employability life skill assessment has questions related to employment. It also has questions related to independent living and life skills. So you could use that same assessment and put it in both sections as your AATA for those areas. However, I wanna specify that you need to separate out the results. So you know, don't put, don't copy and paste from the AAT section of employment, don't copy and paste it down to independent living. You wanna copy or you wanna put in the information specific to employment up in the employment box. And you wanna put the information specific to independent living and life skills down in the independent living and life skills box. One question that we always get is whether or not parental consent needs to be obtained when completing AATAs. I've heard mixed decisions on this. Um, I've talked to a couple different people from ODE, and if you talk to one, you may get one answer. If you talk to another, you may get another. So my suggestion is informed parental consent is needed. So how do you document that they have informed parental consent or given you that consent in order to do the age-appropriate transition assessment? One way that I've seen getting around this or making sure that it's done is on the cover page of an IEP, you can put a statement in the other box stating that the child is beginning the transition process um, and that they will be completing age-appropriate transition assessments throughout the IEP year. Another thing you can do is in your activities, um, and we'll get to 
discussing about activities and services a little bit later, uh, but you could make your activity be completing age appropriate transition assessments, you know, that maybe you already know, you know, based on what it is that the student wants to do that, oh, it might be a good idea to do the ELSA with the student, or it may be a good idea to um, complete a dream sheet with the student, whatever it might be, but you can make those as part of your activities for transition planning. And then that your, once that parent signs that IEP document, that's then giving you that informed consent throughout the life of the IEP to complete those age appropriate transition assessments. Best practice um, is to input information that's provided from multiple people. So it's not just you doing this all by yourself, that there are other people completing these age appropriate transition assessments as well. Um, that you use multiple assessment types. It's not just formal assessments. It's not just informal assessments. And we'll kind of go through that here in a little bit. Making sure that you're incorporating student performance in various environments that you're using multiple sources of data, that the information you share is understandable to all team members, and that you use information that's sensitive to cultural diversity. So it's an ongoing process of collecting data from multiple sources, focusing on those preferences, interests, needs, and strengths of the student, and how they relate to education, work, personal living, and social environments. Students must be involved to the fullest extent possible. The PINs should guide the, those post-secondary goals and transition services and activities that you help design for that student. And like I said before, you need to make sure that you start with those needs of the child. And at least two updated transition assessments should be documented in each of these sections. So best practice, there's multiple people involved within the age appropriate transition assessment. So examples of multiple people, the student, the parent, staff, coaches, vocational rehab counselors, employers, related service personnel, you can gather information from all of those different types of people um, for your transition process. Utilizing multiple assessments, making sure that you're using formal and informal assessments. And we're, like I said, we're gonna talk about that in just here in a little bit. Student performance in various environments. You could collect data in the classroom if the student's out in the community at a work site. Maybe they have a job and um, you're able to get information or observe them in their work setting. Maybe they're um, doing some stuff at home as well. Maybe they're homebound. Um, you can collect information and gather data from the home using those multiple sources of data. And then making sure that it's understood by all team members. So be sure to write it in layman's terms. Don't use a bunch of acronyms unless you make sure that you state what it is. So don't just type OOD. Make sure that you outline opportunities for Ohioans with disabilities and be ready to explain what it is. If that OOD counselor is not able to be at the meeting to kind of explain what their agency does, then make sure that you're well-versed and be able to explain the support and the services that OOD can provide if that's something that you're putting into the IEP. And then again, about that um, being sensitive to the cultural diversity, making sure information is assessed in the native language of the child, utilize interpreters if needed, be cognizant of the student's beliefs and don't shame them. Maybe it's a, um, belief or something within their culture or home environment that they're choosing to go this route in terms of living. Some, um, some cultures expect um, children to remain living with their adults um, or living with their parents on up through adulthood. You know, having multi um, generations under one roof is very common in some um, cultures today. So making sure that you're not shaming that child if they say that their plan is to continue living with their mom and dad um, until they're 30 or 40. Ocali um, has created an AATA planning guide. So there is a link there for that. It has an added emphasis of collaboration with service agencies, especially the vocational rehabilitation. 
The planning guide takes you through a recommended process of transition planning. Each stage of the planning process includes web pages to explain parts of the process, incorporating videos, showing examples, offering reminders, and suggesting tools to help you each step of the way. It also provides a case study for a student named Jessica and how the team would work through the stages with her. The planning guide stresses the importance of a strong network of support and allows multi-agencies to offer different services and supports during that transition process. So I strongly encourage you to take a look at this site as well. There's a lot of really great information, resources, and tools um, that are available to everyone. As I mentioned before, you should have a, a variety of assessments, including formal and informal assessments. Make sure that with formal assessments, especially psychological assessments, that you double check protocols to see if you need to be formally trained in using the assessment. Check with your school psychologist. Maybe they'd be willing to complete it for you if needed. And then they could add information or results to the IEP document for you. Or you could even check the ETR to see if an assessment was completed recently. So within one year's time, maybe the student had a, a, an evaluation team uh, meeting that was completed and the report was done within that year, you know, were age appropriate transition assessments completed as part of that. The Ohio AAT, AATA library, as I shared before, is a great resource. It provides formal and informal assessments designed to support transition age youth as they work toward life experiences beyond high school. These resources include general assessments for educators, families, and students. There are assessments for post-secondary employment, education, and independent living, and then also assessments for health and medical concerns as well. We don't want to bombard students with question after question after question after question without even giving them a chance to process what it is that we're asking. Um, but that just was a cute little example of, all right, so we are doing a very informal age appropriate transition assessment right now with Uncle Jess or Uncle Luke trying to figure out what Jess is going to do after he graduates, if he even graduates. After you complete your AATA, that is when you need to help the student to create their transition goals in the areas of education, employment, independent living. Independent living is a goal area in which many of us think it says as needed, and my student only has a reading disability, so they don't need an independent living goal. Well, keep in mind, an independent living goal does not mean a goal focusing on where a student will live but rather what skills they may need to develop in order to live independently. So when you think of it that way, honestly, then every student should have an independent living goal unless they're living on their own already. I've only known one or two students that were living independently in an apartment on their own. Yes, they do not need an independent living goal. They're doing it, they're showing me. Um, but most students are still living with mom and dad and they still, mom and dad takes care of their food. They do their laundry. They may pick up after them. Like they may not really possess the skills that they're going to need to live independently. So let's talk about this. What are some AATAs that you have found to be beneficial to use with your students with regards to independent living skills? Or how do you decide if an independent goal is even needed? So feel free to unmute yourself or to put it in the chat. You know, what are some assessments that maybe you have found to be beneficial for independent living? Or how do you decide if a goal is even needed in independent living? So we have financial literacy assessments are good for this. Absolutely. All of our students are required to take financial literacy course um, as part of their graduation plans. So, you know, talk to that teacher who's teaching that course, like, what are they doing in that class? You may be able to pull some of that information to use for your transition plan. Any other ideas? Be able to create a budget for monthly expenses. Yes, I've known some um, math classes in high school, you know, maybe part of the math class is working on, on budgeting and they research, you know, the cost of living 
and calculating the taxes and all that stuff. Like that would be a good part, a good thing to use or to incorporate within your transition plan. Those are a form of age appropriate transition assessments. It doesn't have to be a document that you use. It could be a conversation. It could be assignments that they're currently doing in English class. It may be a um, research paper that they're completing. You know, you may be able to get information from there as well. We have a general home safety activity we include for independent living. That's great. Let's see if we can get one more. And then I'm going to share with you my things that I use to help decide if I need to have a goal for a student or not. Anyone else? Going once? Come on, after this, we get to take a break. <laughs> All right, I don't think we have any takers. Okay, so for me, I kind of had the steadfast rule um, with the intervention specialist that I worked with when I was a transition coordinator, that if the student had five needs within their um, IEP plan, then those five needs told me that they needed an independent living goal. So those five needs included if the kid gets mental health services, if they have behavioral needs, if they have daily living skill needs, if they have functional academic skill needs, and if there are any safety concerns. Those five things told me that yes, the student needs an independent living goal no matter what. Again, this is best practice. This is my opinion. I'm not telling you you have to follow it this way. But to me, that's a really good example of, okay, if these five things occur, then I definitely need that um, independent living goal added. So again, that was mental health services, behavior needs, daily living skills, functional academic skills, and safety concerns. All right, so Talia is going to type it in. Mental health services, behavioral needs daily living skills, functional academic skills, and safety concerns. So my rule was if any five of those things were within the child's plan, then I made my intervention specialist have an independent living goal. The other thing I would have them do is to complete an informal interview with this student. So the key things that I would ask them or talk through about is one, I wanted to look at navigating the community. So do they have a strong network of friends and families? Can they access community resources such as leisure activities? I wanted to look at health, healthy lifestyle choices. Can they take care of their personal care and self-care needs? Do they understand emergency protocols and procedures? Can they make medical decisions for themselves? Most students can't. Safety and proactive decision-making, are they able to follow the laws? Do they safely use social media? That's huge. Can they perform basic first aid? Do they know how to get a Band-Aid, where to find a Band-Aid in the home? Um, so basic first aid. Do they get into trouble at school or at work? What about their communication skills? Do they need assistive technology? Do they get along with their peers? Are they able to send emails, make phone calls? Do they require a communication goal? If they're receiving speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, that tells me they're not independent. They need that additional support. So if they need that additional support, are they really going to be prepared to be independent as adults when they leave high school? Maybe. I mean, maybe our thought is if they're in eighth grade now and they're getting speech therapy and they're using an assistive technology or an augmentative communication device, that maybe they won't need it as an adult, but maybe they still will. So how are we going to support them to ensure that they know how to utilize that um, resource independently? What about transportation? Do they plan on getting their driver's license? Do they currently have a driver's license? 
Do they know how to even access transportation? Can they ride a bike to and from places? What about Uber, Lyft? I don't even know if Lyft is even a, a thing anymore, um, but Uber, Lyft, maybe accessing the bus, depending on where you guys live, maybe there's a different um, bus system that they can utilize. So in central Ohio, we have Coda, Delaware, Ohio has data bus. Um, I know Looking County has a bus service as well. So like, are they able to utilize those? Personal finances, do they have a checking and savings account? Is it still under mom and dad or do they have a account separate by themselves? Do they understand credit cards? How debt piles up very quickly? Um, what about a job? Do they have a job? Do they have plans of getting a job? And then lastly, housing. Do they understand what a lease is, what a mortgage is? What about renter's insurance, homeowner insurance? Do they even know where they want to live after school? So summarize your results within that AATA section of the independent living goal to show that you've at least looked into this. And then based on that decision that you have with the student, with the team, you can determine if a goal needs to be added or not. But you need to at least show that you did something to help you determine whether or not a goal was needed. Just saying at this time, the team feels the student does not need an independent living goal. That's not enough. You need to have examples of why you came to that decision. Okay, so it looks like we have a question. Is this one from Heather? Mm -hmm. All right, so I get tripped up sometimes and wondering if it should fall under employment or independent living. And you know, it may fall under both. There's not a steadfast rule or something to follow. Um, so it may look under both, but I guess in my mind, if I already know that I have stuff specific to employment and maybe I don't have as much for independent living, then I guess I'd put it under there just to show that we address independent living. Um, but there's nothing saying that you can't have it in both. You just need to highlight how it impacts employment and then also how it impacts that independent living. After you complete the future planning and the age appropriate transition assessments that identify the student's needs and that it focuses on the preference, interests, and strengths of the child, that's when you're going to start the discussion about measurable post-secondary goals. Measurable post-secondary goals need updated or reviewed annually with new data. So notice I didn't say that you have to write new goals every year, but they do need to be updated or at least at minimum reviewed annually. Maybe the student's goal remains the same over the years. The goal can stay the same. You still need to talk about it, but then your age appropriate transition assessments need to be changing every year. You should not be doing the same AATA year after year after year within the IEP. I will say you can do this, the, an AATA more than once during the education of the student. So maybe as a freshman or a ninth grader, you give the student the employability life skill assessment, the ELSA assessment. And then you give them that same assessment as a senior. The nice thing about that is you're comparing what their skills were as a freshman or as a ninth grader, and now you're showing where they're at as a senior to show the growth that they've had over the years and maybe how they're better prepared to live independent adult lives after they leave high school. So make sure that those post-secondary goals that you're going to create are based on the age-appropriate transition assessment and the PINs. It should happen at a meeting outside of the IEP team meeting. So when you're planning and writing these post-secondary goals, this is not your invention for the child. This is not you coming up with a goal for them. This is you having a discussion with the child to figure out what that child's goal is, what it is that they want to do after high school. The focus needs to be after that graduation. So it's not next year, you don't say in a couple years, you don't say five years from now, you say after graduation or after high school. You need to make sure that you have those three goal areas, employment, education and training, and that independent living, if you believe it's applicable, 
And you are required to progress monitor the goals as well as the activities that support the goals. So we're going to talk about that here in a little bit. The goals need to be identified in those areas of post-secondary training and education, competitive integrated employment. The team must first consider that competitive employment and also that independent living. It's not required, but it if there isn't a goal, the team needs to justify why there's not a goal in that box. So as I mentioned before, you know, having that statement based on age appropriate transition assessments, uh, Peter does not require an independent living goal at this time. You could put that in the goal section, but then you must have those AATAs listed down below the goal explaining why a goal is not needed at this time. The team should be putting obtainable goals in this, in this section. So best practice is that all goals use one of the following sentence starters. You could say after graduation, student will, so Peter will. After leaving high school, Jamie will. Upon completion of graduation, Susie will. Schools are not responsible for the accomplishment of the goal. Schools are responsible for providing the educational programs and transition services that are stated in the IEP. So we can't wave a magic wand if a student says they want to go to a four-year college and, you know, let's say they want to major in astronomy. If a student says that, I can't guarantee that they're going to go to a four-year college and major in astronomy. However, what I am responsible for is providing them activities, supports, and services that will allow them to reach their goal. This next slide is just a pictorial version of how to write a goal. Let me get people to mute here for a second. Um, so it's just drawing out that you have one of those three statements at the beginning. So after high school, after graduation, upon completion of high school, and then you have the student's name, will, what is the behavior that they're doing, and then where and how. So again, after leaving high school. I've provided you with a couple of examples. Again, these are Strictly examples, do not copy and paste this. I just wanted you to kind of see what it is that I'm referring to when I draw it out like that. So upon completion of high school, John will enroll in business courses at Columbus State Community College. After high school, Allison will obtain a four-year degree from a liberal arts college with a major in child development. So those are two examples of post-secondary training and education. Keep in mind, it is not necessary to specify the student's major. It is not necessary to specify what school they're going to go to. Um, but if the student has an idea of that, why not put it in? You know, make sure that if they want to go to OSU, that you don't just say Ohio State. You need to put that they want to go to the Ohio State University. For competitive integrative employment, you could say after graduation, Linda will receive job development services from vocational rehabilitation for competitive integrative employment. After leaving high school, Jody will obtain a part-time position in a retail environment. So those both are examples of that competitive integrated employment. You notice like it says retail environment that it's not a store just for people with disabilities to work at. So um, or it's not a day hab facility that maybe has a little side gig off the, that they sell things that they make in a craft store, something like that. You want it to be competitive and integrated. So how are they doing a job or what job are they wanting to do in order to work with others that are not identified with disabilities and are of the same age or close to the same age. And then for that independent living, we have, upon completion of high school, Jeremy will independently prepare for work each day, including dressing, making his bed, making his lunch, and accessing transportation. Or after graduation from high school, Justin will use a calendar or device to keep track of his college assignments and personal appointments. So you notice those goals are not specific to where they're going to be living, but how they are going to be living independently. 
So we have a question. What do we do if on the AATA, the student has no identified post-secondary needs? They're 18 years old and are adamant they know all they need to know. They have their post-secondary goal, but they feel they do not need assistance in that area. What would we put in the IEP? I think you still need to provide them, even if the student says they don't need an AATA, you still need to provide them that opportunity to take the AATA. I would also document everything you can in the prior written notice. If they're 18 years old um, and they are their legal guardian, so if parents did not retain guardianship of themselves, um, you know, the student has the right to refuse services. So you just need to make sure that you're documenting everything, talking with your director of special education or student services. Um, informing them of this to make sure that you're following the steps and the protocols um, that your district and your legal counsel have set forth for you. Could you provide an example of a goal of a student who wants to obtain employment immediately after graduation and how the two goals for employment and education are different? So keep in mind for education and employment, in order to be employed, people can't just start a job and expect to know everything, right? They need to be trained in that job. So that training for that job could be part of your training and education section. And then the actual job itself would be the employment section. So I strongly discourage having the same goal for both because it really is two separate things. So it's a preparation, preparedness, training for employment, but then there's also the job side of it. Hopefully that answered your question. So once we have our goals, you've completed the future planning, you've done the AATA, you've written those post-secondary goals. So now you need to decide the course of study that the student is going to be completing. And I know this was brought up a little um, earlier on in our conversation about that course of study. So take notes. <laughs> course of study leads to graduation and attainment of post-school outcomes. It's a connection to AATA and post-secondary goals, and it's your career pathways. So the selection of a course of study is an individual decision based on the student's post-school outcomes and individualized needs. It may include a combination of courses and programming. Consider the accommodations and requirements a student may need to help them successfully navigate the course. So off to the right-hand side in the red section of this slide, I have three things listed out there. At this time, this is what's expected for you to put into this section of the transition plan, part five, where it says course of study. You should either list curriculum based on Ohio learning standards. So the students taking traditional classes, they're gonna graduate with their peers. Um, you know, Maybe they're in a college prep type programming. So they're following Ohio learning standards. That's number one. Number two, are they on extended standards? So curriculum based upon the Ohio learning standards, extended. Are they taking the alternative assessment? If they are, then they're following those extended standards. And then your third option is career technical education program with an explanation of what specific CTE program that they're going to be pursuing as related to their post-secondary goal. So those are the three things that you should be putting in that box for right now. Keep in mind, things change. There's rumors out there. Um, don't be surprised if at some point, and we don't know when, we don't know how, but there may be that requirement that you actually have to list out what courses the student is taking. So not just stating that it's Ohio learning standards, but maybe you're gonna have to lay out, you know, algebra one, English language arts, um, maybe it's a English language arts class that they're taking. Maybe they're taking a personal finance class, a social studies class where you actually list the name of it. In my mind, like things start spinning and I start sweating because I'm like, oh my gosh, these are high school students. They change classes every semester. They're not necessarily year long courses. Does that mean that we're gonna have to amend IEPs throughout the year to plan and prep for this? Maybe. Um, we don't know exactly what this guideline is going to look like, but from things that we're being told coming from the top down is this will be a requirement eventually once forms are updated, but we don't know when that's going to be yet. So I would suggest start planning for it now. 
you know, thinking ahead, if you're writing an IEP at the beginning of the school year, you know what classes that student scheduled for the, for the remainder of the year. So you could always put that in there. Um, or if you're writing it midway through the year and they're in eighth grade, you know, you could list out the courses they're in in eighth grade and then what courses, you know, are they likely going to be taking in high school? You know, we know that they're all required to take an English, a math, a social studies, and a science. We don't necessarily know their extracurricular type classes, but at least you can get it in the basics, I think would be the best practice. <clears throat> So after you've identified that course of study, you need to determine what the student needs to reach their overall post-secondary transition goals. So to do this, we want to complete backwards planning to lay out your plan of action and to identify as a team what supports and services, agencies, and activities the student will need to meet their goal. So what is backwards planning? <clears throat> Backward transition planning is a focus first on adult outcomes for the youth's future. So you plan back from there to the present. So if you think of the calendar and where the student is right now, let's say they're in eighth grade. Let's look at the end of eighth grade, or not the end of eighth grade, let's look at the end of their high school career. What is it they wanna do after they graduate? And then we have what they're doing currently and then it's that middle part that we're going to be filling in and identifying, okay, this date, we're going to do this. By this year, we're going to do this. By this year, we're going to do this. As a multi-agency team, you want to guide the student and discuss what support services and activities will need to be completed to assist that student up through graduation. So this next slide is a video from the Employment First, um, all on backwards planning. Backwards planning is a way to think. It's the natural way we usually go about planning for any kind of project by first having the outcome in mind and then thinking backwards to decide what needs to happen first and then what needs to follow to complete a project within a timeline. We should follow the same process when making plans for a youth to transition successfully to adult life. The plans and ideas about a youth's path to a successful adult life can be documented on the backwards planning template seen here. When developing a backwards plan for a transition youth, the process works like this. Based on the youth's post-school goals, decide what the youth will need to know, be able to do, what they experience, need to have in place in order to achieve a post-school goal the following year. This is called the milestone. Once the milestone is identified, Think backwards to present time and the current status or baseline of the skills and facts associated with the youth achieving that milestone. Now that the two anchors for planning are in place, the steps in between can be identified. The two anchors provide a point of reference for the plan, so the team can decide how much and at what pace skills can be improved and new learning can take place in each of the intervening years. And the facilitator's guide. That describes what a team might be doing to engage in each step of the process and on the right hand column of each page provides corresponding information from Jeff's case study. Check it out as a resource for getting a team started with backwards planning. All right, so that video you can actually in our resources um, that you'll receive at the end of this there's that bitly link. We've put a document in there with all the links that we've included within this um, presentation. And that whole video is listed within that link. I did condense a video and took some stuff out of it just for time purposes. Um, but you can go back in and you can see the entire video and it goes through the case study. I think they said the student's name was Jeff. Um, they go through a case study kind of walking you through all the steps of that backwards planning process. So it's a really good idea to take a look at that if you still have questions about backwards planning. So what are transition services? According to IDEA, the term transition services means a coordinated set of activities for a child with a disability that includes instruction, related services, community experiences, the development of employment and other post-school adult living objectives, 
and when appropriate, acquisition of daily living skills and functional vocation, functional vocational evaluation. So you'll notice I kind of separated it out by colors. So when you read that definition, it specifically highlights those three areas of transition. So anything that involves instruction and related service would be activities and supports that could go underneath education. For the employment side of things, you know, community experiences, development of employment and other post-school adult living objectives could go under employment. That post-school adult living objectives, as someone mentioned earlier, it kind of overlaps with that independent living as well. I couldn't make a two-tone uh, color-wise for the services there, but it could fall in both. And then when appropriate, that acquisition of daily living skills, functional vocational evaluation. So what are those transition services and activities? I cannot give you a list of every transition service and activity that's available. This is something that you create or that you feel is going to support that student so that the student can reach their end goal. So an activity for one student should not be the same activity for another student. It can be the same activity. But if the state were to come in and review your documents, if they're doing any form of internal monitoring with OEC, and they see the same activities are being provided to every student that has a transition plan, that's going to be a big red flag for them. It needs to be individualized. <laughs> Excuse me. Each goal area must have at least one transition activity listed. You should have more. Best practice would be to have more than one transition activity, but at minimum, you should have at least one for each goal area. Transition activities should span the life of the IEP. Transition activities must be guided by an adult. Therefore, should say things like the intervention specialist will do what? Or the guidance counselor will do whatever the activity is. The transition coordinator will. The OOD coordinator will. You shouldn't say activities, you, you shouldn't say um, provide the opportunity. So you wouldn't wanna say the intervention specialist will provide an opportunity for Peter to do whatever. No, this is what opportunity or what activity will be done to support that student. So it should be a coordinated set of activities for the student with an outcome-oriented process. It promotes movement from school to post-school activities, such as post-secondary education, including vocational training and competitive integrative employment. Each post-secondary goal must have at least one transition service activity based on those obsessed pins that we had already talked about. It's coordinated, so they'll reasonably enable the child to meet those post-school goals. And some examples of transition act, um, services or activities might be transition instruction, community experiences, development of employment, adult living project objectives, related services could be an activity, um, any daily living skill instruction, functional vocational, that should say instruction, not evaluation, I need to change that. And then also linkages with adult agencies. So it might be that your activity, maybe you're linking them up with OOD, Opportunities for Ohioans with Disabilities, but maybe the activity is going to be setting up appointments and times and meetings to sit down as a team. So the student transition coordinator, OOD coordinator to talk through their plan or to update their plan. Your activities that you come up with should not be a simple, you do it one time and it's done. Activities should be ongoing throughout the year. So I will say that like in the past, and I will take credit for this, that I you know, was new to the whole idea of transition and coming up with services and activities before I earned my transition to work endorsement. And so I would just put in there the activity of, going to visit the career center. And all my sophomores got that activity on their IEP. And I think probably many of us put that as an activity, but that activity is a one and then you're done with it. You do it one time, you go and visit, you're done. So really a better activity would be preparing for that visit to the career center 
that maybe the intervention specialist will sit down with Peter to research, you know, four or five programs offered at the career center to then decide which programs he wants to visit on sophomore visit day. So you don't do that one time. It's saying that you're going to work with that student, you know, when you talk about your um, plans of services and the frequency of services, maybe you're going to meet with him three times to work on researching the programs offered at the career center. That that would be the activity, not necessarily going to visit it because every sophomore, at least in my previous district, every sophomore went and visited it. So you're not individualizing this activity for the student if you just put there that they're gonna go visit. But instead you could put in the activity of doing the research with that student to prepare them. So let's talk about the coffee cart conundrum. Many districts offer a coffee cart or something similar that students with disabilities run. Notice I put the little air quotes there that they run the coffee cart. Oftentimes it is the students with intellectual disabilities and the para pros are the ones interacting with the purchasers who are generally other staff members. I ran a coffee cart. When I taught a multi-disability classroom at the high school level, I thought I was a genius for creating this coffee cart idea. Come to find out, many people do a coffee cart. And there's nothing wrong with coffee carts. You do learn great skills as a student, preparing them, working on employability skills. But more times than not, if I were to go into a district to observe their coffee cart, at least what I've seen in several of the districts that I've been in, it's generally the students pushing the cart and then it's the adult actually doing the interaction. Or maybe the student has an argumentative communication button where they press the button and it says good morning, but then it's the adult who actually does the interaction and takes the order and makes the coffee and collects the money, whatever it might be. We really need to be thinking of how are we offering integrated activities and services to our students with disabilities? What does that look like? And if we are offering a coffee cart, what are some ways that maybe we could tweak it to ensure that it's more of an integrated activity? I know one thing I did prior to leaving my role as the intervention specialist in the high school classroom, we started having peers come and support the role. So it was no longer the para pros. It was no longer those adults. It was the peers. So it was other sophomores, juniors, seniors, students that came with us. And then we really set up the role of my students, those with multiple disabilities are the ones that take the order. They're the ones that collect the money. They're the ones that interact with the staff members. We weren't allowed to sell to students, but we were allowed to sell to staff members. So that's one way we did it. So let's talk about this, or you can put it in the chat. What are some ways that you guys are offering integrated activities or services for your students with disabilities? We need ideas. We need to share with each other other things that you guys are doing. So go ahead and you can put that in the chat or take yourself off mute. I'll talk since nobody's talked yet. Thank you. Um, hi, so I just started, I'm a transition coordinator at Marion City Schools, and we just started a program for our um, juniors and seniors that are in our, um, we call it our specialized learning center classroom. And so they primarily, in the sorry, our bell. Um, in the afternoons, they're doing all kinds of work um, experiences. So they got in the community two days a week, and then we just started stocking our concession stands here in the building after every game. So their job is to go and count inventory and figure out what they need and what we need to order and all that. Awesome. Are you able to have peers kind of assist them with that or is it just the students with the disabilities? So we haven't. That's a great idea. I um, just have the students with disabilities and then their teacher and two aides are in there. The teacher and two aides are pretty good at like staying hands off and letting them kind of figure out how to do it. So, um, so far so good, but that's a good idea. I mean, that's great, Jackie. I love, I mean, even providing students with just the employability skills is huge because for so many years, 
we didn't do that. You know, it was, they were in their room in the basement of the building away from everyone else so that they didn't cause trouble or whatever it might be. You know, they were kind of hidden and people didn't really see it. So the more that we can get them out interfacing throughout the environment, I think is going to be huge. And then again, that piece of if you're able to tie in peers, you know, some school districts are able to provide like a, you know, you can talk to your counseling staff or administrative staff of like, are you able to provide a credit, you know, for volunteers to support in the classroom during that period? Um, Because even just the skill of working alongside someone without a disability to see what they're doing, how they're doing it, how they interact with their friends. And that also like we had started a school store. And so I had, it was only during the lunchtime and I had peers work in the school store with us. So obviously we couldn't pay them, but I was able to give them credit or partial credit towards their graduation for volunteering in this classroom setting. It was like a social skills credit or something like that. And my students ended up gaining more friends and social skills because these peers had their friends come to talk to them. And then they could see, you know, how do these teenagers interact with each other? I mean, for those of you that don't have your own personal teenagers, they have their own language that they speak. And oftentimes it's through Snapchat. Um, or text messaging or whatever it might be. But how great is that, that now these students have the opportunity to interact with the peer working with them, but then also to interact with that peer's friends as that friend comes over to talk to them. And, you know, when you find those great peers to volunteer and to work with your students, it it's life changing because you as a teacher can kind of step back at that point. Because really what they're gaining and the skills that they're gaining from that interaction is far more than you as a teacher will ever be able to teach them. So thank you so much for sharing, Jackie. I really appreciate that. Anyone else? We got a couple comments in the um, chat. Amity, hi Amity. At the Career Center, I'm working at, we incorporate resume writing into our post-secondary transitions. That's awesome. Many of our students will have opportunities to do real interviews later in the year for the work-based learning. They will do during their senior years to that end. We also practice interview skills, reflect a lot on what all is required for interviews. That's awesome. So I just wanted to add something as well. Um, when I was a teacher a very long time ago, um, and this was before transition is as big as it is now, one of the things that I did with my students to incorporate all three aspects of the transition session is we would run a business from my classroom. Um, one of the things that we did is we would make um, suckers at holiday time with the chocolates and the molds and all of and all of those things. And then we would sell them to the teachers. So the educational part of that was essentially running the business, making the product, getting it out and delivering. So they had to be educated in how to do that measuring. I was able to tie in math skills and reading skills. And then employability was they saw the profits coming in by selling these things learning how to run a business, learning how to be a salesperson. And then we took the practicality of that out into the community and the money that we made, we would um, go to a restaurant or go on a field trip somewhere else where they literally had to use the money. I didn't, I didn't do it for them. I gave the money to them and they had to pay for their food. They had to order their food or they had to pay their admission, make sure they got their correct change bag, things like that. So you can even, um, get one activity that you create and tie it into all three sections of the IEP. So that's just an example. Great, thank you. And I see that um, Joanna gave an example in the chat. And even though it says Dan Burke, it's actually Jackie Hughes. <laughs> hey, Jackie, um, that gave an example as well with doing, um, hoping to one day create a farmer's market, but for now they're gardening, um, growing things, making salsa, pickles, salad, um, stuff like that. So that's, these are all great ideas. Great, great, great ideas. So thank you so much. 
So the numbers of the annual goals related to the transition needs, the number is what you need to put into, if you look at section five of the IEP goal, it has that box, and I don't know off the top of my head exactly what it says, but it says something along the um, aligning to what goals within the IEP. So that's referring to the goals in part six, into the goals of the IEP, not the transition goals. So you have to identify in those three area, how are you linking this to an IEP goal? And you're going to actually put the goal number in. So you don't want to say in that little box in part five of the transition section, you don't want to say um, one through five or all. You want to specifically write out like one comma three comma five, you know, whichever goals it's relating to. So Ocali has a really nice resource titled Transition to Adult Guidelines. Within the guidelines is a section on transition planning and the IEP where they identify seven elements of the transition process. Similar to the transition frameworks that I showed you earlier, element seven is titled Align Annual Goals to Adult Outcomes. And this slide is a screenshot of what's shared on the Ocali site. So at the bottom of the slide is a link to the resource online. I've also included it to the resource links within our bit.ly folder that you can access. And as you can see, the annual goals on the left-hand side of the slide, that's what you may find in section six of the IEP, and then how they directly tied it to those post-secondary goals um, within section five of the IEP. So that first one, maybe the child has a goal on organization or on study skills. Well, they're relating that to the post-secondary education goal because it's the ability to organize complete assignments in college within an allotted deadline. Or maybe they're working on um, following a schedule to complete a task. That could also fall under independent living. So the ability to use a schedule to complete a routine, such as dressing, cleaning, cooking, medication, administration, so on and so forth. But then you could also have it be tied to more than one area of transition. So that last one, independently requesting assistance to complete a task or problem solve a situation, they've tied that to all outcome areas. So it's the ability to request assistance, could be safety for independent living. It could be related to employment environment. It could also be related to asking for ass assistance in post-secondary education. So again, I, you know, take a look at this resource within Ocali. It was really, it was a, I had a hard time finding something that really outlined how to make that connection. And I think Ocali has done a really nice job um, of connecting the post-secondary to the actual goal of the IEP. So now that we've linked the goals, we need to talk about progress monitoring. So that final step of transition planning is ensuring that you are progress monitoring each of your transition services and activities. You are not required to complete the optional form of 6B transition progress report. I've put the picture of it here for you. Um, you can come up with your own way of progress reporting, but you do need to make sure that you have certain elements if you're using a form different from the OP6B form. So you need to always have the date, the reporting period, the post-secondary goal that you're referencing, and then the transition services and activities outlined, a summary of the outcome or results, and then the status. Has the activity started? Is it in progress? And has it been completed? It is okay to mark that something has not been started, you guys. You know, we write these to be year-long activities, but we also know that life happens. And maybe, you know, you have this vision of starting something with a student you know, right at the get-go of the IEP, but then something occurs that maybe you have to wait until next semester. That's fine to say that it's not started. I would just make sure that you're documenting why it hasn't started. So the state hasn't really outlined for us what that looks like. I would definitely put it in the prior written notice. I would also write it up into, you know, you could put little statements up in the AATA section. Um, for like when you're writing the next IEP, maybe something didn't occur or take as much time as you were expecting it to. You can kind of outline like a summary of that. 
Um, but you always have to report progress on those transition services and activities. And the progress needs to be reported the same time that you would re issue report cards or interim reports um, to traditional students or other students within the um, district. So anytime a report card goes home, anytime progress report on goals in section six go home, you also must do a progress report for transition progress reporting. All right, so we have a question. Can you clarify how to enter dates in section five? Are they the same as IEP start and end date? That's a great question, Vicki. You want it to be, yes, you want it to be the same, but it doesn't have to be the same, you guys. So if I know that I'm going to be doing an activity for a student and we're going to be meeting monthly and or maybe we're even meeting, you know, biweekly, whatever it is, I would put the same start and end date as the IEP. But if I know that I'm not going to start something, like maybe I write the IEP in August, but I know I'm not going to start a certain activity until January with a student when they return from winter break, that I would make the start date be that January return date. And then your end date of the activity would be whenever the IEP is due for a renewal. So it doesn't always have to be the same, but you need to make sure that you're explaining, especially when you have the IEP meeting, explaining to the family and to the team why you put the dates the way you did. The only other thing I would say too is just making sure again, the activities you do are not one-time activities. Make sure that they are you know, long-term, you're providing a service to the student. So it shouldn't be a one-time thing. And then should we write how often to do the activity? Once a quarter or should we say four times? I would be careful with just saying quarterly. Um, I like the idea of saying that you're going to do it four times throughout the year because then that allows you to be a little more flexible. Um, but again, you don't want it to be four times the final quarter, right? So I don't know that you have to get that specific, but making sure that when you're documenting that progress and you're putting, if you're saying that it's not been started, you know, be realistic with yourself and to the team that if you wrote something and it's supposed to be done multiple times and you're getting close to that due date and you still haven't started, you need to be calling an IEP team meeting or at least calling an amendment meeting to talk with the parent and the student about why the service wasn't done the way that you laid it out and then amending the IEP to reflect that. That's a great question, Melissa, thanks. So that final step in our transition flowchart includes coordinating services with adult agency. So that flowchart on the left-hand side, that little pink box at the bottom, coordinating those services with adult agencies. This can actually be done anytime throughout the transition process, uh, but you just wanna make sure that, you're, that you are doing that. Availability of, and eligibility for agency services varies for students based on the identified need, their level of skill, and the identified adult goals. So connecting early to adult community resources allows you time to become familiar with the agency and the service, to address questions and concerns, to complete required procedures, and to create the necessary linkages to prevent a gap in service at the point of graduation. So with that, some agencies your student may not be eligible for. So be careful when you're writing things into the IEP as a service or activity. If, if you write it saying that they will get connected with, you know, that the intervention specialist will connect Peter with opportunities for Ohioans with disabilities to receive employment services. That's a great activity, but I can't guarantee that he's going to qualify. Side note, students that are on IEPs, if they need services, they're going to qualify for OOD services, but they still have to go through the application process. Um, so just make sure that the way you write it isn't, isn't dictating or guaranteeing that these services will be provided by the agency because they may not qualify for that agency service depending on what it is. So I just wanted to throw that little caveat in there. So what are some adult agencies that you may want to familiar familiarize yourself with. Let me go to the next slide. 
Examples of adult agencies that you could connect the student with include um, the ones that I've listed here on this slide. So OOD, Opportunities for Ohioans with Disabilities, County Board of DD Services, Vocational School, Career Center, um, Job and Family Services, Ohio Means Jobs, Disability Organizations, Advocates, Parent Support Groups, Mental Health Professionals, Social Security Administration Representation, College Disability Service Coordinators. Those are all examples of adult agencies that you could help get the student connected with. The link that I have here for you is to a Padlet that I created. So for the, um, as I mentioned before, I'm an adjunct professor for Bowling Green State University. The three classes I teach are titled Interagency Collaboration for Transition. In the first course, we focus on education and training. The second course, we focus on employment. The third course is on independent living and social activities. Within each of these classes, my students are required to complete what we call a community resource investigation in the area of transition of the class that they're focusing on. So for my um, first year students for that 6901 course, they need to do a community resource investigation on an agency or support services that focuses on education and training. So oftentimes it's um, college programs and their disability services, or maybe they have a program just for students with intellectual disabilities and they earn a certificate for being a part of that program, they would include that. So like I said, I've been teaching these courses since 2016. So that's three semesters, three courses each. So I've gone and I've read a lot of community resource investigation reports over the years. And I've compiled the websites of the different agencies that my students have done the report on. So I'm not sharing my students report, I'm just sharing the website related to their investigation. I've broken it down in the Padlet by the 16 regions of the state support teams across Ohio. So when you go to this page, you'll notice that there's, well, there's 17 columns. The first column is kind of an explanation of how to use the Padlet. And then the other columns are state support team one all the way through state support team 16. So for those of you here in central Ohio, we are state support team 11. So if you go to the 11 column, you're gonna have um, address or the website to our state support team website. Below that, items that are in purple are county boards. Mind you, I do not have all the county boards listed because they have not all been investigated within my classes. I'll keep adding to this over the years, um, but I believe off the top of my head, I have Delaware County, Licking County, Franklin County, um, Board of DD might have Madison. I don't remember off the top of my head. But then below that, in the pinkish reddish color are resources for education and training. So there's different colleges listed there, Ohio State, um, Columbus State, I can't think of that, maybe Ohio Dominica might be there, I don't remember. Um, and then below that in yellow are um, employment uh, programs and services. And then down below that in green are the independent living and social skills. So, this is for you to use. Feel free to share it out. Um, we are not endorsing anything on this page. It's just resources across the entire state. Um, so if you're not from our region, look at your state support team column to see what all is available in your area as well. Also, if you get a chance, be sure to follow our social media. So we do have a Facebook page. We have a X or Twitter page. We have a SoundCloud page. That's where we put our podcasts that we hold. Um, we are also on YouTube and LinkedIn. So be sure to follow us on all of those sites. Um, we post all of our upcoming PDs, services, activities that we do. If you ever come to any of our events that are in person, we will post um, pictures from the events. So, and we'll tag your district if you're in attendance as well. If you ever have any questions, you can reach us at the generic email of sst11 at escco.org, or you can reach us individually. I am erin.curtis at escco.org. Talia is talia.williams at escco.org.